Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Institute of Politics. My name is Max Schachermeyer. I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard College, visiting from the London School of Economics, where I study philosophy, politics, and economics, and I have the privilege of sitting on the forum committee. Now, in the event of an emergency, please take note of our two exit doors, one on JFK Street side and the other on Park side. Please take the exit closest to you and congregate at the park if need be. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and then join me for a very warm round of applause to welcome President of the Institute of Politics, Jana Ramadan, and the former chair of the JFK Forum, Anan Hafez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kenny Jr. Forum. Uh, my name is Anand Hafiz. I had the privilege of being the chair of this program um, last year. I'm now a senior now. My past four years in this program have been fantastic, and it just seems like a very amazing way to, to end it on a, on a sweet note. Um, uh, I am a senior, like I said, studying government and economics, living in the Elliott House, which is just across the street for those of you who came in in person. Um, and uh, I'd love to pass it off to my lovely co-moderator, uh, Jenna Ramadan. Hi, thank you, Anand. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Ramadan. I'm a junior at the college studying government and modern Middle Eastern studies, and I'm Palestinian American from East Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm so, so excited this year to be serving as the president of the Institute of Politics and welcome you into our Arab American Heritage Month Forum. Tonight's conversation is going to be about building space for Arab Americans in public service. And we're welcomed by two incredible guests, Noor Taguri and James Zogby. So I'm really excited to introduce Noor to you all. Noor Taguri's innovative storytelling spans across media. At 28 years old, Noor is an award-winning journalist and producer, a touring speaker for over 10 years, and has told stories in every medium from radio and print to documentaries and brand campaigns. In 2019, Noor founded At Your Service Imprint, a consulting and production company telling representative stories as a form of service. With a finger on the pulse of people's concerns, Noor's storytelling is recognized for her innovative approach to fostering relationships across lines of difference. And I have the fantastic pleasure of introducing Dr. James Zogby, who is above me today, um, uh, joining us virtually. Uh, James Zogby co-founded the Arab American Institute. It's a Washington, D.C.-based organization which serves as the, pol uh, the political and policy research arm of the Arab American community in 1985, and he continues to serve as its president to this day. He's also the director of Zaghbi Research Services, a uh, firm that has conducted groundbreaking surveys across the Middle East. Uh, in September 2013, President Obama appointed Dr. Zaghbi to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, and he was reappointed to a second term in 2015 and concluded uh, his service in May 2017. Uh, he's featured frequently on national and international media as an expert on Middle Eastern affairs. In 2010, he published his highly acclaimed book, Arab Voices. And in uh, 2013, he published Looking at Iran, uh, The Rise and Fall of Iran in Arab Public Opinion, and also 20 Years After Oslo, which are both drawn from his extensive polling uh, across the Middle East with Zogby Research Services. His most recent book um, that's coming out is The Tumultuous Decade, Arab, Turkish, and Iranian Public Opinion, analyzes the transformations taking place across the Middle East region following the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq and the Arab Spring. Dr. Zogbi has also been personally active in U.S. politics for many years. In 1984 and 1988, he served as the deputy campaign manager and senior advisor to the Jesse Jackson presidential campaign. In 1988, he also led the first ever debate on Palestinian statehood at that year's Democratic Convention uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And in 2000, 2008, and 2016, he served as an advisor to the Gore, Obama, and Sanders presidential campaigns. So please join me in giving them a wonderful round of applause for joining us today. And so I'll start off with the first question today. Um, to James and to Noor, thank you so much again for joining us. You both tackle public service in very, uh, and identity politics in very different ways. Um, James, you've navigated the advocacy space um, through the establishment of several organizations, such as the Anti-Discrimination uh, Committee, Save Lebanon, and now the um, Arab American Institute. And Noor, you have made headways in journalism, in uh, social media, and podcasting uh, in a way that's captured the young um, Arab <coughs> voice. 
Uh, I'd love to start our conversation by talking about why you chose that specific route through politics uh, and what inspired you to take that route in public service. Who would you like to go first? We'll start with oh, you. Start. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, James. I was really excited for your answer. Um, okay, so my, it's interesting because I actually never really <coughs> considered the politics side of the work that I do. So my work is rooted in story. I am a storyteller, story listener, story gatherer, and I believe that the change that I can influence is by getting to know people and getting to understand proper representative storytelling around communities that are typically misunderstood and misrepresented and <coughs> then amplifying those stories. So as someone who's incredibly curious, I kind of like to go and find the experts and find the people who are doing the work and then try to produce a story that answers the questions that we have in our heads and the ones that I have come across in just like my own curiosity. And then similar to the Harvard style question, which you guys told us about backstage where the questions end in a question mark, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my stories typically end in question marks because I think that stories, I believe that stories are constantly evolving, they're constantly living, they're constantly something that we should revisit and they are how we connect with one another and within that connection is where we can learn and change. And so originally I wanted to focus on television journalism, that's what I always thought I was going to be doing, um, but along that journey, the more intentional we got about the stories we were telling, the more I realized that it's always story first, medium second. And so it wasn't about telling stories through television, it was about what is the story that I want to be focused on right now and what is the best way I can tell it. So the story that I'm working on right now around representation in America within in media, um, we're telling it through podcasting because of the Muslim tradition of oral history and the Arab tradition of oral history. And we wanted to create an audio experience for people to be able to while listening, feel like they're listening to stories that their ancestors are telling them or that the people around them are telling them and, and collect it that way. So it, it, it constantly varies, but it's always rooted in story. Beautiful. And um, Dr. Zogby? Well, it's a long story um, <laughs> that I'll tell. And I'll try, to, I'll try to just encapsulate it a bit if I could. I, I was a child of the, the civil rights and anti-war movement period. I mean, I, I came of age during that time. Uh, I knew very little about the, the Middle East and ethnicity because I grew up in a multi-ethnic community. It really wasn't an issue. I mean, other than, you know, everybody had a nickname. It wasn't really a big question. The 67 war was a turning point uh, because it was traumatizing to, I think, uh, those of us who are of Arab descent who had not experienced anything like that where the, the image of the Arab uh, all of a sudden became a negative almost overnight. Um, if you trace Hollywood films before 67, it's one kind of movie. After 67, it's a very different kind of movie. Um, and all, I was speaking at an anti-war rally at Temple University and somebody shouted out, why are they letting the Arabs speak? At first, I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> uh, I got fired from a job because I was, the parents didn't want their children being taught by an Arab. It had nothing to do with the Middle East at all. Um, I'm not going to play victimhood Olympics here, but I just want to tell you that as I got more into it, my wife and I spent a summer in 71 uh, living in refugee camps in Lebanon and Jordan as I was collecting stories to write my dissertation. I came back and I wrote articles on it and all hell broke loose because I had done what wasn't supposed to be done. I humanized the Palestinian story. They had been dehumanized and you shouldn't tell about the mothers and fathers that I met and the grandparents that I dealt with and the stories that I heard. Um, I got a teaching job, and as I got the teaching job, it was, you can teach everything but the Middle East. Um, I started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign because I wanted to focus on human rights cases because I'd taken one to Amnesty International US, and they said, sorry, we don't deal with those here. It's too controversial. Um, ACLU similarly was shy on dealing with some of our, our, the problems that we brought to them. I joined a coalition, the Coalition for a New Foreign and Military Policy, went to their meetings. We had a vote to accept us as a member. 58 to 3, we won. Um, the organizers of the, the coalition came and said, it's really important that you withdraw because three groups said that they would 
pull out if, if we let the Arab group in. Uh, when I started the Anti-Discrimination Committee, we wanted to focus on that issue. Um, and it only got worse. As we got empowered and organized, the backlash became greater. Uh, so much so that we did a fundraiser for Wilson Good, mayor of Philadelphia. He gave all the money back because an opponent, his opponent said he's taking money from the Arabs. Um, when I did Jesse Jackson's campaign in 84, it was a turning point for me because I saw Arab Americans for the first time welcomed into a presidential campaign, turn out in enormous numbers across the country. And I saw a politician in the case of Reverend Jackson actually wanting them on board, right? And so we started the Institute shortly thereafter on the because we realized that the key to empowerment wasn't whining, wasn't writing treatises, whatever. It was gonna be organizing the vote. And, uh, and we did. Uh, in, in 1985, right after we started, uh, the, I got a call from people in Dearborn saying, uh, the mayor here uh, is running a campaign and he sent a tabloid to every home in the community saying what to do about the Arab problem. Uh, there's too many of them, they don't, speak our language, they're ruining our darn good way of life. People were shocked. I went there, found we had a city of 19,000 Arabs out of 93,000, only 700 were registered to vote. So we started a voter registration project. Guess what? Flash forward 10 years, the mayor of the city came to an event that we did, same guy, gave me the key to the city, spoke a little Arabic, uh, my dear brothers and sisters in the Arab <laughs> community gave me the masbaha of the city instead of the key. That's what he did. And, um, and it's because he knew how to count. We were then at that point up to 7,000 registered voters. Today in Dearborn, mayor is Arab American, the state rep is Arab American, the majority of the city council are Arab American, the police commissioner is Arab American. Um, the vote mattered. And similarly, I had been invited to a meeting during the Carter administration with Vice President Mondale. Three days after the meeting, I got a call from public liaison at the White House saying, we're so sorry, but we can't have you back again for the follow-up meeting. Some groups complained that we let an Arab in the meeting. Um, it was the anti-defamation that did it. Um, and I, what could I do? It was fine. Today, we're having a meeting tomorrow, Arab American Heritage Month, Month meeting at the White House. Um, Half of the speakers representing agencies of government are gonna be Arab American. Um, of the 400 interns who've come through my office, about 150 of them have served in public service at the White House, State Department, in Congress. I mean, the, the fact is, is that what we found was as we empowered ourselves, we got to define ourselves. If you're weak, your opponents define you. But as you grow in strength, you define yourself. And actually, people come to you. When we do events now in states like Michigan or in parts of Pennsylvania or in Ohio, places, oh, I'm going to be in, in Chicago uh, next month for the Arab American Democratic Club event. Everybody running for office is going to show up because they want the Arab vote. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have that power, we wouldn't have that recognition. And so how I got into politics and why I got into politics was I wanted to put an end to the whining because whining is not a political strategy. Complaining doesn't get you anywhere. Edward Said used to say, politics isn't about fairness because if it were, the Indians would be running America. <laughs> it's never about what's fair. It's about do you have the capacity to make change? We didn't, now we do. It's not perfect, but we're further along than we ever were before. And I'm, I'm proud of the work that people across this country have done to create an Arab American Heritage Month, which is now recognized by governors in 36 states. That's a big deal. Um, and we're, we're just really proud that we're here. Thank you. No. Thank you. No, thank you, James. And I really wanna harp on the fact that you brought up defining yourself and defining your identity. I think perception of self is a really interesting concept, and especially for the Arab community where being Arab has meant so many different things. I mean, James, you mentioned the 1967 war. You grew up through the, 19, the 1970s. You have the oil crisis, the Gulf War, the intifadas. Now you're growing up in like the post 9-11 era, thinking about the conflation of Arab and Muslim identities, thinking about the Arab Spring as well. And so would love to hear from both of you about what your Arab identity meant to you growing up how did that kind of shape or drive your journey through public service? But also, what do you think kids our age, like Anan and I and those that are in the audience, um, how are they going to see their Arab identity in the context that they live in right now? Mm, great question, Jenna. 
So one of the experiences that I've been on in this journey of like the story that I'm telling right now about rep, I origin it was originally meant to be focusing and examining the impact of the misrepresentation of Muslims and Arabs in American media and how that's impacted American culture and society as a whole. And I kept referring to it as the representation series. Like I wanted to really focus on media representation because that was this thing that I, I kept seeing the negative impacts of it, but I couldn't understand why it was happening as consistently as it was. And in the beginning, I thought I completely understood the story. I, I thought that I knew it like the back of my hand. It was a story that I had been living since I was a child. It was rooted in like the shame that I had about being Muslim, about being Arab, growing up in a majority conservative white town and not knowing exactly who I was, and then seeing that oh, well, I was consuming the same media that the people around me were consuming, so of course I'm going to be susceptible to these stories and these narratives, regardless of how much you are surrounded by love and pride for who you are, it's still going to be hard because we are a culture that consumes a lot of media. So that's what it started as. And then in this journey of like trying to control the story that I thought I knew, I realized it's actually really difficult, maybe impossible, to properly tell a story about others or about concepts if you are not familiar intimately and deeply with the story of yourself. And I think that I had to, I had to, I had to literally recalibrate my entire brain because I was so used to telling stories about other people or focused on like concepts and issues that I thought were impacting our communities. And I decided to start the series by telling like the story that was that felt the most untrue about my own family. So in 1986, the US uh, conducted an airstrike in Libya, which is where my family is from. And in an attempt to assassinate Muammar Gaddafi, the dictator at the time, they ended up hitting an apartment complex, a civilian apartment complex, that housed my family. And so it ended up killing five of our family members, and not Gaddafi. And, um, and that, the trauma of that incident had carried out on throughout generations in our family. I mean, it was only 36 years ago. And so I, I thought about this story because I had re-watched this the movie. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Back to the Future. Um, and I noticed that the opening scene had Doc and Marty running and Marty asks Doc, who are we running from? And he says, the Libyans, of course. So you have this scene of like these terrorists who are saying words in gibberish and, and of course they're Libyan. So out of curiosity, because I knew that movie had come out, of, out in the 80s, I checked what year it had come out and it had come out less than a year before the airstrike. And it clicked for me in that moment for the first time ever that I realized I could start putting puzzle pieces together about the stories in our family and about my own identity. That, that story that misrepresented the Libyan people contributed to a bigger narrative that people had around the US airstrike on Libya and just the conversations that were happening about Libyans and Libyan people at the time and it was directly tied to the media that people were consuming. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that Back to the Future is the reason that this happened. But if you look at or think about the stories that you're consuming and, and the intricacies and the identities that are, that are focused on within those stories, they are all interconnected. And so the way that I've been able to really understand and think about my own identity is to actually put all of the labels aside because those always sat pretty uncomfortably with me in general. Because I noticed that when people were putting labels on me, it was that they were putting me into a box that I didn't identify as. For example, for a very long time, when I first started journalism when I was 15, uh, the press and people, even when I would get introduced for a talk like this, like I was always referred to as an activist, which is the worst thing that you could tell a journalist, um, or at the time that's what I believed because that's what I was taught in journalism school. 
And the only reason I was referred to as an activist was because I, just, I wore the hijab. There was no other reason. I was telling stories about water main breaks or I was telling stories about um, medical cases of uh, abuse of people with intellectual disabilities or the sex trade. Whatever it was, like I was still being referred to as an activist and I couldn't shake it because I knew that it was me being put into a box based on what my perceived identity was. Mm -hmm. So in order for me to build a relationship, a better relationship with my actual identity today, which has been the craziest journey that I've been on in my entire life, I've had to put all of that aside and say, okay, what is the story I've been telling about myself all of these years? What is the story that people have been telling about me all of these years? And this happens on a broader scale and also on, like, in, in your own intimate relationships that you have with people. And what, what I've started to realize is that I wasn't going to be able to find those puzzle pieces that I was looking for until I started figuring out what my own puzzle pieces for myself were. And so that starting point that I had where I was able to take this story that, that has impacted my family, that I've seen impact my family, I've seen how that intergenerational trauma has impacted the people in our family, and then tie that with like this, the narratives that were being told around that around our community and basically start with the story at home and then move out. So then get to know the stories of the people that you surround yourself with or the, that you choose to love. Then get to know the stories of the community and culture that you're in. And then I, I'm starting to like now shape a better image of who I know I am. And that was completely outside of the traditional labels that were put on me. And in this point, in, at right now, as I'm sitting in this chair with you all now, I can confidently say that I identify as Libyan or Arab and Muslim and all of these things, but that's because I did the work to figure it out. And it sounds really uh, odd, maybe, because some of these labels might be so obvious, but how are they supposed to hold any weight for us if we're not actually building relationships with the words and the language that we're using to describe ourselves? So I think right now my, my journey of identity is still evolving, but I hope that it forever evolves because I don't want to be the same person I am today, tomorrow, if I'm on this journey of constant growth and evolution. Oh, that's beautiful. And James, what about you? How did the political context when you grew up kind of shape how you saw the Arab identity and what you were up to? I want to make two observations. One is um, about the, the Arab American identity. And the other is uh, about the um, the journey itself and, and why it was an important one. Um, about the Arab American identity, one, one of the issues that we've confronted from the beginning, from the very beginning, was the insistence on others to define us um, and, on, um, and on the external factors that shaped us. Uh, when you're excluded, uh, that is having an impact because if you're a young person wanting to get into politics, you don't want to identify with somebody that's going to be excluded, right? And so that becomes an issue. Um, mm -hmm. If you are a person seeking a profession, um, you don't want to be the Arab guy if that's going to get you into hot water um, and become a tar. I, I, it happened to me. I, first teaching job I went to uh, at Shippensburg State College. They interviewed me. They said, oh, you're great for the job, but it's going to be a little too controversial for you to teach the Middle East. Somebody from your background shouldn't be doing it. They had a, a, a Jewish guy teaching the Middle East. They had a woman from Britain teaching the Middle East. That wasn't controversial, but the Arab guy was going to be controversial. So I taught four sections of intro to religion is what I got to teach. Wow. Um, uh, those external factors were shaped us for a long time. Um, and there were internal problems as well. I lived through the Lebanon Civil War, right? Where Muslim versus Christian, Palestinian versus Syrian versus Lebanese, et cetera. Um, when we started the Anti-Discrimination Committee, one of the things we were absolutely crystal clear on was that we were gonna define ourselves in the broadest sense as a community that was going to defend itself, support itself, and recognize no boundaries within that community that would separate us. And there are, there are people who tried to do it. I remember a Lebanese ambassador came to my office one time, an ambassador, you were the Lebanese ambassador to Washington. He said, how do you organize your staff? I said, um, we got the organizing unit back there. We got the research unit over here. We got the financial people. He said, no, no, no. How do you organize them? I said, by function? He said, no, no, no. The guy Rami out front, 
he's Chia, isn't he? I said, I have him. I actually have no idea because I never asked him. It's not on the job form. And I don't know what his religion is or even if he's from, I don't know where he's from. And it never was a question. We had a dinner one time where we gave an award named after Najib Hanabi, the Queen Noor's father. We gave the award to an ambassador, U.S. ambassador who served in three different countries um, as an ambassador who was Palestinian American, Najib Halabi Syrian American, and the person presenting the award had served in the Obama administration and he was a Lebanese American. And I said to some of the Arab ambassadors after the event, I said, you guys are always telling us we gotta get together. We just had an award named after a Syrian American given to a Palestinian American and presented by a Lebanese American. You couldn't do that anywhere in the Arab world. So stop telling me what we need to do. We've actually done it. We've seen no boundaries. It's, we've, we've established an identity that is, includes all of us without exception as part of a community. We don't discriminate based on religion, based on country of origin, or based on generation here in the country. That was, that was important. We will not let groups like the ADL define us, and we won't let religious groups, Christian or Muslim, within our community define us either, or pull us apart. Um, uh, we face challenges all the time with this, but it's critical that we maintain the sense that we are a community. That's, that's one part. And the second is the, the question of the, I, I remember right in the very beginning when I started the Anti-Discrimination Committee, uh, it was Halloween. Uh, my kids went to uh, their school dressed in their Halloween costumes, and I have a picture of it in my office. Uh, there was kids dressed with sheets and money bags and guns. I was back when you could do that, toy guns. And they were Arabs. They dressed up like Arabs on Halloween. My kids came home and said, we don't want anybody to know that we're, we're Arab because look. a month later there was Thanksgiving. I went to the school principal and I complained. She said, we're going to deal with it next month. We have this great idea. It's going to be heritage on Thanksgiving so that not only the, the, we're going to have the Indians with the, you know, the white men. I always think Thanksgiving is kind of weird. It's like the Indians saved us and then we went and massacred them and drove them across the country. It's a little, it's a weird holiday. But anyway, the, the, uh, they said, we want all the kids to come dressed in their native costume and bringing their food. So I said to the kids, this is going to be great. And they said, no, they wouldn't do it. I got there that night. There was an Israeli table with girl behind the table dressed in Ramola. The, you know, each village in Palestine has a different pattern. This was Ramola. And they had Israeli food that was hummus, baba ganoush, the bully, and everything. And I, I thought... You know, we lose the land, we lose the food, we lose the culture. Um, we have to reclaim it. We have to reclaim it. And so it's been a journey to reclaim it, to define it ourselves, and to proudly possess it, and to humanize it. And that's the last part of this, is the humanizing of the story. I told you about when I wrote the articles about Palestine. I think we're still there. Um, what you said, Noor, about Libya is, I mean, the problem is, is that they die, but they don't count because they're faceless. They're faceless. No, I bet that the stories of those people who died were never in the paper. They were never, never published. Interview. Yeah, if you, look, was, if you look up the stories, it's interesting that you say that. And thank you for sharing that because I also want to just say that your work and the work that you've done is why someone like me can think the way that I can, like that I have the space to be able to expand this concept of identity because you guys laid that groundwork because the, the identity was already, the misrepresentative identity was, was put on you so harshly. So your experience, of course I've had different experiences of discrimination or whatever it might be, but it is a blip compared to what you've gone through and it's clear that that has made you the leader that you are and I hope that the experiences that I've gone through do the same, so thank you. But Specifically to what you I just, just want to get back on that, just the, the, the issue about the mm -hmm. objectifying or the, the, the dehumanizing. Uh, the Palestinians, for example, are never people. Mm -hmm. They're always a problem. Yeah. They're always a man. You know, they're, they're, they're murderers, they're terrorists, they're this, they're that. Um, an Israeli kid gets killed, and it's, it's gruesome, it's awful, it's horrendous. I, 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 I condemn them when they do it, when Palestinians do it. But you know the kid, you know his face, you know the story, you feel the pain. When the Palestinian experiences the same thing, 
you just don't see it. It's not there. And the result is, is that um, because we're a faceless mob <laughs> of sorts, you know, Iraqi dead don't count. Uh, what, what the U.S. did in Abu Ghraib was a shocking thing for a moment. But think of the thousands of people who went through that experience with no one to understand that they were human beings who were treated in such an abominable way and are still suffering the trauma from that. An entire nation, Iraq, still suffering a trauma from what we did. We, we have enormous compassion for Ukraine every single day. What we did to Iraq was so much worse and never understood and never felt in the same way because the human lives, human lives don't count there because we don't know their names, we don't know their stories, we don't see them as real flesh and blood. So I, I wanna just thank you for what you do because by putting faces on those stories, by giving that history, by making them come alive, you make it more difficult to dehumanize and objectify them. Thank you. I, I just thank you so much for saying all of that. I think one of the biggest takeaways that I had from that experience and you just affirmed it so much is that I realized that the story that I was telling was from the perspective of what governments typically call collateral damage. And mm -hmm. when you look into the story of the, the, the airstrike, the acknowledgement of their deaths was, is nowhere. You can't find it. I mean, I went through eight hours of archival tape of the coverage of that week, and you can see that it was documented at one point, but it's not on history.com. And I realized in that process that there really is no such thing as collateral damage. That's just, that is an excuse for us to deter ourselves from the humanity of people that we can't face and we don't have to face anymore. But that the trauma of all of it still exists. And, and that's why when I said earlier, the, the point of story still being alive, this, this story that I share about that experience, about covering the, because originally I wasn't going to do something so expansive on, on that story in particular, but I, I mean, I literally dreamt about my family. Like I saw them, I, I was able to, I somehow was able to put faces to these people that I had never met before. And I realized that telling a story from this perspective is actually a form of justice. Storytelling is a form of justice. And sometimes, and, and just like you said about not complaining or not whining, I think that obviously there are so many layers to the way that justice needs to be carried out, especially when it comes to the Palestinian people. And one of the forms of justice is constantly telling the truth out loud over and over and over again. And that has to start with us. You have to tell the truth about yourself out loud over and over and over again so that you understand what it means to sit with somebody or to stand with somebody shoulder to shoulder and witness them in their entirety. Because that story that I told about my family, like they, even the people who, they were waiting for that story to, to still be told. My great uncle who, who, who was the one who broke the news because he was a con constant news consumer and he was watching the, U, the, the White House press conference and heard, and heard about the attack and then called my family in Libya and told them to go check on, on the, the family members in that villa because he knew that something had happened. It was in the middle of the night for them, so they didn't know what was going on. So he was in Oklahoma telling them. And that, like the, the, the story coming to life, the way that we were able to, to do so, it gives the people who are gone life over again. And, and it recognizes that they are still here with us, that we still have this responsibility to constantly revisit our own histories and the stories surrounding us so that we can carry out that justice. You know, I think it's we very a, fascinating. Uh, oh, excuse me, Jay, please, please go ahead. And we, uh, I, when I was doing the television show that I did, uh, Viewpoint, uh, we, we, we did three shows, one uh, a week before the bombing started in Iraq. I was teaching at Davidson College at the time. Um, and uh, my, the network said to me, we want to do a satellite hookup with, uh, uh, with Baghdad, University of Baghdad. So we, we connected students at the University of Baghdad with the entire student body at Davidson, at Davidson College. They all, they all turned out. And the, sh this, the, the conversation was stunning. I mean, when the, the satellite came up and you saw the Iraqi kids sitting there, in, at Davidson, there was an audible gasp in the room because they saw these kids. 
And after it was over, a young woman came up to me and she said, it was so hard looking them in the eye and seeing, knowing that we were going to be bombing them in a week. What we did with that show, if we could have done it on a bigger scale, was we humanized the Iraqi story. They were real people. And for years afterwards, kids from Davidson would say, have you ever heard from that kid? Did you ever hear from this one? Did you ever? They worried about the kids because they got to talk mm. to them for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. So we did a repeat show. Um, we did a repeat show on the fourth anniversary. And it was absolutely stunning to have the kids back again. Um, and uh, um, yeah, the best use of media is to bring people together in that way and flesh out the story and make it make it come alive. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, that doesn't happen often enough. Um, and, uh, and so we're left with, you know, with, with the opposite, right? With, with media being used to pull people apart uh, or and shout at each other or you know, call each other names or, or deeply polarized conversations. But I, I just wanted to share that, that, uh, that Baghdad story because it, uh, it was important to me. You know, I think it's really fascinating to see the generational progress that's been made since uh, from you, James, to you, Noor, and although you're only a, a few years older than me and Jenna, um, all of our experiences combined um, and sort of inspiring the youth and many of the, my peers and students here in the audience today. Uh, I know as Palestinian Americans who grew up in the United States, me and Jenna yeah. experienced a lot of what your children uh, probably did, um, Mr. Zobi, and so, so thank you so much for highlighting that story. Um, we've reached sort of pa a little bit past the halfway mark now in our forum, and so I'd like to invite members of the audience, if you want to go ask a question, any question you'd like, um, to our wonderful guest speakers today. We have mics here on the floor, so there's one over there. Uh, there's one up, there's two up here in the boxes, and there's one here on the floor to my left. Everyone knows the routine. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, we know the drill. So please, yeah, feel free to line up, ask your question, go upstairs if, you, uh, if there's a line forming, uh, and you can ask your question more directly up there. Uh, I just ask that you, name, you say your name, your heart affiliation, um, and make sure that every question ends with a question mark, because uh, we know Harvard students love to make speeches. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I'll do a one last short question before we go to our audience questions. Um, I'd love to shift a tiny bit and talk about how you're viewed by the general public as, as trailblazers in both of your fields, um, and sort of the little relative uh, engagement and involvement we see sometimes by Arab Americans in politics, you become that representative for the whole community and you become that spokesperson um, for everyone. Even uh, a lot of people might not know, James, you're not Muslim, uh, but you sort of, a lot of people um, may, might associate with that throughout your entire career. Uh, and so you sort of become the spokesperson without even asking for it for that type of community. So I'd love to hear how you handle that sort of pressure um, throughout all of your work. Sure. Two, two observations. One is my wife. Um, when I started this work, um, I was very rough around the edges. Uh, she used to come to every speech I gave, and I used to say, I, I, so I spoke to an audience of one, because I was looking at her the whole time. And when I'd say something uh, a little extreme or harsh, she'd wince. Like that, so we used to count them as a joke, 12 winces, five winces. When I got to know winces, even after she had a stroke uh, two and a half years ago, and I, I was in the, with her in the hospital every day. Um, and uh, one t only time I left her was, it was uh, Martin Luther King Day, and they were honoring Jesse Jackson in Greensville, South Carolina, and asked me to come down and speak. And it was too much, too many parts of my life all coming together. She said, you gotta go. And I came back and I played her the, the little recording of the speech, and she looked at me and she said, "No, no winces." Um, <laughs> that that idea of that idea of um, speaking in a way that that doesn't give vent to your passion, but respects the audience you're talking to, um, and and let's at the end of the day, people will like you, and if they like you, it makes all the difference in the world. Um, and the, the problem, too often, you know, in the old days, when, when Arab speakers would be on television, they'd be, ah, you know, it's like they'd be so angry. And they had a right to be angry, but the anger turned people off and turned them away. That didn't work. The other, the other quick story is I was introducing Jesse Jackson the very first time 
at a Palestine human rights campaign event in 1979. And every, all the media were there, all three, at the time there were three, three networks, New York Times and the Post and the Chicago Tribune, they were all there. And it was a huge audience. And I was going out to introduce him and Jesse pulled me back. He said, when you're in the wings, you can say whatever you want, any way you want to say it. But when you're on center stage, be careful what you say. Because if you say it wrong and in the wrong way, it will hurt you. It'll hurt me. It'll also hurt the whole community that you represent. And so be careful what you say and how you say it. Those two, my wife and Jesse, uh, were important in having me understand that everything I said and everything I did had a, had a consequence. And I had to be careful and understanding of that. Um, and I do, I live it every day. And it's not hard. I mean, actually, it's not hard at all. Uh, it becomes who you are. Um, uh, so I'm done, sorry. <laughs> I really love this conversation and it's it's really so fun to be talking um, alongside you James because I, I, I really love intergenerational perspective overall and it's beautiful to just kind of witness the evolution of it I think for me um, yes to being mindful of what you're saying and knowing what you're even when we I asked you before this like what is the intention of tonight what are we what are we trying to accomplish where are we moving toward um, the other thing is knowing who you are in service of and what, and, and what service you are trying to provide in the position that you are in. And I do think that that starts with yourself too, because if you're, if you're doing your work simply for people pleasing purposes, like you're not, you're constantly going to be swayed and influenced in ways where you will completely lose yourself, which is yeah. why I said to begin with, you have to know your story first. But I want to emphasize something that I feel is very, 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 very important for the question that you just asked. And maybe it's a little controversial, who knows, but this is the journey that I've been on. I think it's really important when you learn from people, when you witness people who are in public service, who are storytellers, who are public, whatever it may be, that you see them as an individual person and not as a representation of an entire community. Because then we are generalizing and we are saying, oh, everything that person is, is exactly who this whole community is. And then you create a different version of that mob, of that just blob of generalization. And it's dehumanizing. Because one, you're, and this is a really kind of cringy story, but I remember the first speaking agency that I was ever signed with. Um, my agent called me. I was the only, I was the youngest speaker, second to youngest speaker, and the third top speaker. So there was a demand for what I was talking about. And my agent called me with like happy. And she said, we just had blank Muslim woman try to sign with our agency. And we told her we don't need her because we already have more Tagore. And I remember thinking to myself, and I was, I was probably 19 or 20 years old, and I was so stunned, I couldn't believe it because one, like the insecure part of me thought, oh, so I, like, I'm being tokenized and therefore like, can easily be replaced in this. And even though what I'm talking about is so in demand, you don't see, a like we have hundreds of, older white men, lots of athlete like coaches and stuff on our roster who don't even write their own speeches, you guys do, and yet there's only room for one, and that's what you're telling me. And when we put that kind of pressure on people, and by the way, I like didn't process this until years later. I couldn't figure out what was so wrong. I left the agency, but, um, but it was something that I, I couldn't really figure out. And then I realized, oh, and this is a woman who, by the way, like, there has been some tension or like, I've never really spoken to her, but there is this sense of horizontal hostility and horizontal hostility is essentially when there's hostility between people who are in similar like groups or have similar goals and, and viewpoints. And I think what I realized is that horizontal hostility is often can happen because of this pressure that we put on people to fully represent a group of people. And it's not fair on that person and it's not fair on the rest of the people. It's how we contribute to the burnout of so many of our public figures and, and 
how we push them out of the community because so many people are saying, you need to be more like this. You're not doing enough of this. You're not doing enough of that. And so we're like, we don't want people to be performative in their work or in their activism, and yet we're demanding that of people without even realizing it. Mm -hmm. And so in conclusion, if you see me on stage speaking, like my, it's that Twitter bio, right? My viewpoints are my own. Yeah. Like I am me and speaking to you as just Noor today, nothing else. And that's how I've started to see people. And because of that, I'm starting to see people in such nuanced ways. And I'm so excited to like get to know people this way. I don't see you as a Harvard student or a Palestinian American. I mean, obviously, those things make, make you up. And that's because you shared those with me. Mm -hmm. But I see you as Anna and I see you as Jenna. And that is where I am able to gain more perspective and see the potential for the spaces that we can create for individuals to show up as themselves. Thank you so much, and thank you to Amazing. both of you. I'll turn to our audience now. I'll start here on our left. Uh, if you could just give us the name, your heart affiliation, and your question, please. Try again. Try one more time. Say, say it one more time. They might have just turned the microphone on now. Hi. There yep. you go. Hi. This is, this is Barbara Shavitz. Uh, first, a uh, big salute to Jim Zogby, a friend of mine from DC. But really, I have a question for Noor. Uh, I'm a fellow journalist. Are you speaking of the US bombs that fell on Tripoli? Yes. This is amazing. I stood in that house. I stood in that house the morning after the bombing. Oh. And I want you to know. There were a group of American journalists, Western journalists, who were in Tripoli for anticipation of there being those kind of hostilities. And the role of journalists, we felt like the most important contribution that I made was to be there, to witness it, and to write it. So somewhere in our archives, there is a mention of that. We weren't able to get back to the neighborhoods again to see what it was, but I, I was in that house. And I would love to know, just from your perspective, whatever happened to the family? Like, tell me the end of the story. What happened with the family? Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. I'll tell you one thing that happened to the family. A representative of that family is sitting here on stage telling her story. At yeah. Harvard University. Wow. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. It. I don't even know what to say. Um, so. My great uncle's wife, their cousins, it was her parents and siblings, and she was never able to go after that, so she never got to see any of this. So the fact that you stood in that apartment is um, so incredible because my family here couldn't. And the, the deaths of everybody, like my mom tells the story in the, in the podcast how like she, they confirmed it because of the CNN coverage. They saw um, one of our uncle's bodies was uncovered, and that's how they were able to confirm the story. But it was the, like, and she was in Virginia, and my, my great uncle was in Oklahoma, and he is an archivist himself, like, by hobby. So that's how I found all of the, the archive that did document. So thank you for being one of the journalists who did do that. Um, what happened to the, I mean. Are they still in Yeah. Um, the rest of the family, I mean, a lot of, a lot of us are in Oklahoma and in Virginia. That's where a lot of them are. But yeah, most of them are still in Libya, and it's an interesting... Um, who are you with? Wall Street Journal. Wow. I was watching all of the archival footage, and I was like watching the journalists uh, try to cover the story on CNN and things like that. And it was interesting because I like didn't really see any, um, I didn't see any Libyan voices that were amplified. And I remember thinking, except for like a local news story that was done on, on my great uncle and his wife. But 
I, yeah, I don't even I don't even know what to say. The rest of them are yeah, they were all they're all still there. Everyone is still there. Um, everyone who was there at the time is still there for the most part. I'd love to share with you my perspective yeah, I would absolutely I'd absolutely love that. That is um, yeah, I don't even know what to say because, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, the big breaking point that I had or the breakthrough point that I had with doing this work was I like, rec so, so this, that, this morning, not this morning, but the morning that everything changed, I was just closing my eyes, I was meditating and I saw the family and I saw the apartment building that was demolished rebuild itself. It was just like this image that I saw in my head. And I saw them all standing together like a family portrait, like they were waiting for us. And, and that night, so after that, I felt this need to go through the eight hours of archival footage. I found this Phil Donahue segment that he did during that time on that day. And that Phil Donahue segment had, and it's funny because I was thinking about this when James was speaking about just like the nuances and conversation and all of the conversations people are having and sharing these perspectives. Phil Donahue did that that day. And there was one um, journalist, Sanford Unger, who was sitting on, uh, at, uh, on the panel and he literally said, um, he was like, but if we're talking about foreign policy, you have three white men sitting here. And I understand the, like, the, the benefit of this conversation, but like, the voices are missing. Mm -hmm. And then we had like the, the, the group of Americans who were talking about it, and honestly, the, the perspectives were so much more nuanced. The empathy was so much more heightened. And I realized, like, you know, this is 36 years ago, but somehow, like, stories have been told better, but a little bit worse, and that's why it's kind of on us. And, and it was after I watched that footage that, like, that night, I had this dream. And I was in the apartment building too. And I was there during the bombing. I felt everything, I smelled everything. For like days after my ears were still ringing, I heard it. And it wasn't, and, I was, and the family was together. So I knew that they were together. And it was, a, it was a really crazy night. My husband, Adam, was there, and he was like holding me for hours after that. And it was after that that I realized, like, oh, they were waiting for this story to be told by their own. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing until I did it. And that's why I say, like, when my team asks me, like, what is the thing that you want to get out of this? Like, I just want people to ask their families to tell them the stories of their own, because those exist. All, everybody who's in this room is in here for a reason. And thank you, just thank you, for doing what you did for standing there when my own family couldn't. That's all I can say. Thank, thank you for you, your powerful seriously. question. Thank you. Um, I want to get a couple more audience questions. If you could do this box and this box concurrently, uh, quickly, and then uh, we'll get answers from both people before we wrap up. I really can't follow up with that, but that was really beautiful. Um, my question is not as good. So, <laughs> um, I'm Ciara. I am a Harvard Divinity student, um, and thank you so much for this illuminating conversation and how beautiful this all was. Um, as an Iranian American, I get frustrated about the generational mental barrier between Arab Americans and Iranian Americans that has become actualized particularly when it comes to supporting the diaspora who are involved in public service and other um, places. Uh, to your knowledge, Dr. Zogby, I was wondering what is the Arab American Institute or other organizations doing to bridge these divides in order to create a broader coalition that represents all MENA Americans or more inclusively SWANA Americans for issues that affect all of us, because there are many, as we have seen with the census campaign. Thank you. And over here? Hello, uh, my name is Chitsu. I am a third year at the college, um, and I, 
I'm really honored to be here in your, both of your presence. And uh, I just wanted to ask, obviously I'm not Arab American, um, but I could find a lot of empathy and also some parallelism between um, the Arab American um, issue and also, sorry, I'm still reeling in from the previous question. <laughs> um, but um, as a Tibetan American, I'm, I often uh, feel pressured or also, um, not necessarily scared, but it is hard to suppress the frustration I may have um, talking about my culture and my family's background. Um, kind of going off the point that Mr. Gori mentioned earlier about telling the story, telling the truth, even though it's hard. And um, then also what um, Dr. Zabi was saying about the finding the right way to say it. I would love to know a little bit more about how you found your craft or how you found that way to to say, tell your story with, without anger, without necessarily the, what other people may not find as um, easy to hear, but also can obviously send a really important message, um, especially because we're so closely related to the issues today. It's not like there's that many generations or years between us. So sorry for rambling, but thank you. Thank you. Dr. Zil, we would like to take the first question. Sure. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of work with a group, Haya, uh, and we've done some work with Nyak. Uh, and we poll, actually poll annually for, for Haya. It's a, a group, both of them are, are Iranian American groups. We, uh, we also partnered with them on the census, creating a category. Um, I, I just want to, it was a device to create a census category, the MENA category, Middle East, North Africa category, but it's not an identity. And we, we, you know, there are some who've attempted to create a MENA month or something. It's, they want to get rid of Arab American Heritage Month and have MENA heritage. Or the ACLU did Ahimsa month. I still don't even know what all those letters stood for. But what I did know was that it's our damn month and leave it the hell alone, right? It's like, if other groups want to have a month, that's great. I love it. And we will celebrate their months with them. But we work too hard to turn Arab from being a liability into an asset, from being a, a defamed category to one we could be proud of and pass on to our children. I don't want to dilute it with a whole lot of other, uh, other identities getting into the mix. Um, that said, we share many commonalities with the Iranian American community, also with other uh, ethnic groups that are not from the Middle East. Um, and we work in coalition on hate crimes, we work in coalition on civil liberty issues, we work in coalition on civil rights and voter rights and language rights, um, and we work, uh, we, we work together on, um, um, on, with the census, on getting a category that allows us to create MENA, but also then put in the specific ethnicity under MENA so we can separate out Arab Americans from Turkish Americans and from others and have that a number count that we can use for ourselves. Um, and on the, the second question, if I could, um, you know, my, my, my mom used to say to me, uh, when you're talking to someone, she'd say, if you want them to listen to you, hear them first. I, I always think it's important to, to in, because then it teaches you not just something about what they have to say to you, you, you learn from them, but it also makes you aware that when you're speaking to them, that you're speaking to them in a way that you want them to hear you and listen to you. You want to make a connection with them in the, in the way you, you talk to them. Um, sometimes I used to do a, a, I do a TV show at night and it would, you know, I do the nightline with Ted Koppel and people would come in and the next day they'd say, I saw you on television yesterday, you're on CNN, right? <laughs> no, I, I used to then correct, want to correct them. I said, no, no, it's fine. I said, how did I do? And they'd say, oh, you were great, you looked great, you smiled. And I, they did, the, the, re, the words done, didn't register, the content didn't register, even what network it was on didn't register. What registered was, it was an Arab guy, they liked him because he smiled. And, and that meant a lot because Arab guys don't smile. Uh, and they, they don't keep, no, no. <laughs> what can except I say? this one. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> my, my dad, I, I, I tell people that I, everything I learned, I learned in the grocery store from my dad. Two supermarkets opened within three blocks of his grocery store, but people kept coming back to the store because they liked them. 
and they, they liked Mr. Zogby and they wanted to go to his store. We are really great at business, and I hate to use a stereotype, but, but, but Arabs, Iranians, people from our part of the world, we're really great in small business. If we took those same skills in business and brought them into our politics, we'd be successful. But if we took the way we did politics and brought it into business, we'd be poor. Because <laughs> somebody would come into the store and we'd say, you gotta buy this, it's the best thing, don't you know? <laughs> they don't want to be yelled at. What they want, they want to start with, how are you doing today? You look great. Did you change your hair? Oh, that's nice. It's really nice. And you're looking at the peaches. Let me let me help you. You know, they want to have a relationship with you. And so my feeling is that when I'm speaking to an audience, um, I want them to want to have a relationship with me because through that conversation, I will learn from them what their interests are, but they will then learn from me what I want to say back to them. It's that sense of I'm not talking at them, but I'm speaking with them mm -hmm. that changes the very way you you you, you behave uh, in, in conversation with people. Yeah. Quick shot you before you Yeah, I'll take it a little more yeah, yeah. like, you know, I like this, the, I'm like more the sole answer. I love this balance. Um, I think that to tell the truth when it's difficult, and to, I think, alleviate the anger that you might be feeling. Like, the way that I approach storytelling is through a healing lens. Like, I'm telling this story so that I can work on my own healing. When I spent three years investigating the sex trade in America, I worked on that story so that I could work on my own healing that I had for my own experiences. When I'm working on rep, like, that's the same thing. And it was interesting because one of the questions that I asked my great uncle, who is the one who, who I, um, we're talking about for the story and I asked him like did you have like do you have any resentment or feelings towards America because of what they did to your family and of course I'm sure at the time I mean this is 36 years later so the answer that he gave me and again we are always evolving the answer he gave me this time what he was he was like you know, I have my opinions about the American, the different American governments, but the American people have always been great, and he has had so much love for them. And what I and what he was speaking to was his direct experience with the people that he sees, like right here. And that's why I keep coming back to like the importance of seeing people as individuals, because when Brene Brown says this, like you can't hate people up close. And so when you have those people in mind, when you're looking at into, like that's why it's so awesome to be here in person and not virtual. Because we're having this, this conversation, the way that it happened, like would not have been able no. to happen in the same caliber if this was a fully virtual event. So that's one thing. But when you, like I think it really comes back to your intention. Why do you want to tell this story? And if any part of that is to contribute to your own healing, then the rest of it will open up. And you, it will be easier. But I'll give you one um, piece of advice that my co-writer and producer, Zaren Burnett, said to me two days ago. I was at, he, he is, the way that he works, the way that he writes is like unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. And I asked him, like, what does he do when he feels blocked? And he was like, writer's block, like, he's of the belief that there's no such thing as writer's block. Seth Godin also talks about this. Um, but he's like, it's not, I'm not blocked. Like when people have writer's blocks, it just means that they're not confident in what they're saying. Like you're doubting your idea. It's like, because that, that's confidence, that's not block. But he's like, I, when I know I have a task or when I know there's a story that I need to be working on, I'm not gonna waste any of my mental energy focused on the emotions around how I'm, I'm feeling about it, what the insecurities are. And I would like to take that a little bit further and be like, it's not your responsibility to think about the reaction of other people or, or, and follow that path of anger and see where it takes you. But like your focus, your responsibility is your own healing so that you are able to properly tell this story. And then you have to trust that the story is going to do its job. That was the, the day that this episode came out, the one that I'm talking about, about my family, was one of the hardest days I've ever had. The day before, I was so excited. I was like, I can't wait for this to come out. The day it actually happened, I was like, I don't know if I want the world to hear. Like, this was for me. I did this for us. Mm -hmm. And it felt incredibly vulnerable. It was so difficult to let go of it. And I had to accept that this story has a life force of its own. It doesn't belong to you. Once you commit to telling a story, you have to also know that it no longer belongs to you. And where it's going to go, the ripple effects of that story, 
that is what you have to put your trust in. You'll never see the full ripple effects, but maybe sometimes, once in a while, you'll have an incident like this just happen, <laughs> and you will see the ripple effects of that story, and you'll recognize and realize it, but you have to trust in it first. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in the audience who asked the question and for all of you for being with us and kind of witnessing that moment. Um, I think it's something really valuable and special happened tonight, whether or not you're Arab American, just being able to connect and really resonate with the intergenerational traumas and the family stories that we have and bring into this space. Um, as we're wrapping up, we want to just have some quick rapid fire questions. Oh, fun now. Um, so a little bit of fun and levity into the space before we close out for the night. Um, so Anna and I are going to ask two quick rapid fire questions, one for Noor and one for James. I'll start with James. Um, but today, Harvard Public Opinion Project released their annual spring report. Um, their topics focused on the Biden administration, education, identity, and mental health. It's the largest survey of young Americans. And if you're curious, you can see a little bit more about the information, the results that the public Public Opinion Project found at iop.harvard.edu. Um, but James, in terms of planning for our next poll, what's a topic that we should add to our poll next time around? Any thoughts? It was Biden administration, <laughs> education, mental health, and identity. That is not a rapid fire question. I know, but like it's one word, it kind of counts. <laughs> Just wait till you hear yours. No. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I do polling for, for a living. Yeah. That's not a poll question. That's a, <laughs> that's an entire focus group study. Uh, that, no, no I, 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 don't, I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, okay, I, love, love <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I, and I can't do it quickly, so I'm, I'm just going to pass it, if you don't mind. If you no, don't you're mind. totally no, fine. You're totally that's good. a great answer. It's you're a great leading answer. by example. No, being able to say I don't know is yeah. a very powerful call as well. Exactly. And Noor, you have a tradition of writing poems in the morning. Is that true? Oh. Right? And so I would like to ask you, what's your favorite poem or, or what do you write about in general? Oh my gosh. Wow. Sorry, James. I got way easier <laughs> answer question. Um, it's so funny that you say that because I used poetry as like I, when I came across poetry when I was a teenager, I didn't realize it then. But now I know that the reason I was going, I was so in actually when I was nine, I started writing poetry. It was for my own self-discovery. And then I took a, I used to perform poetry and for years in between when I started doing more speaking, I paused with that. And it wasn't until this last year while I've been working on this that I've been writing so much more poetry again. And I realized, oh, I'm on this journey of self-discovery again. That's where this comes in. So I've actually been spending mornings painting poems. Oh. And um, I started, I did this the first time um, with my sister-in-law, Sabrina, who's in this, the room right now. You may know her, Jenna. And um, I, I just literally, because I didn't want, I don't want to like change anything, I just paint, it's stream of consciousness. That's what I'm just yeah. gonna get to. I just, it's just an entire download. So recently, I think I, what was the last one? Oh, I wrote a poem about the importance of being connected to source. And um, yeah, it was pretty spiritual, but it was great. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I want to start off by plugging our future for our last one of the semester, uh, Wednesday evening on Ukrainian humanitarian aid. Um, but other than that, uh, please have a wonderful night. We can invite you to join us up here on stage if you want to ask a few more questions to my uh, friends who are uh, fasting. And for those of you on stage who are fasting too, uh, I like to say Ramadan Mubarak and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. Good job, guys. Thank you, honestly. Appreciate you. Awesome. Amazing.